the decline of the samurai rule. Bakamatsu. Period. Part 1. The Bakamatsu era, 1853 to 1867, was the final period of the political power being held by the samurai. As mentioned in a previous episode, the Sakoku period came to an end with the arrival of the black ships and Commodore Matthew Berry's threat of gunboat diplomacy in the year 1853. The family that had been entrenched in power by Tokugawa Ieyasu were soon to see their power fleet like the cherry blossoms on the wind. The Edo period was to end and see the transfer of power to Emperor Meiji and the Meiji government. The Bakamatsu was essentially a period of civil war, which reached its pinnacle at the Battle of Toba Fushimi. Bakamatsu can be translated as the end of the Bakafu, i.e. the end of the Shogun and the Samurai Feudal Lord system. As the gates of Japan opened to the world, Bakafu decided it was best to embrace foreign trade for the betterment of Japan. Although, this was not a unanimous position among the elites or the folk of Japan. There were a number of key factors that encouraged the significant change. A realization that the industrial powers of the West posed a significant threat to the security of Japan and sovereignty remaining in the hands of the Japanese. Circa 1852, although the Shogun had closed the borders of Japan, the Shogun and his elite advisors still thought it necessary to find out about the happenings in Asia and the world. This was done by the Dutch Trading Company. Incidentally, the Dutch Trading Company was in that time worth more than any company we have in our world today. Returning to the point at hand, Rangaku, or Dutch learning, served not only the purpose of keeping up to date with Western technology, but also to learn the news of the shifts in the balance of power in nations and on the international stage. One of the notable fears was the British success in neighboring China during the First Opium War between the years of 1839 to 1842. That was a series of battles that were fought between the British and the Qing Dynasty of China over the sales of opium by British merchants and Bengali merchants. They came over from Bengal and took advantage of a hungry market. The sale of opium allowed the European powers to balance the trade deficit as China had recently outlawed opium sale with the penalty of death. The end of the Opium War resulted in Hong Kong becoming a part of the British Empire in 1842 with the Treaty of Nanking. As well as the forced opening of trade with Britain at a number of different ports across the shores of China. Pertinent to Japan, this brought the influence of Western industrial powers closer to Japan. The Bakafu learned of this war via both the Dutch and Chinese, and notably the power of industrial weaponry. Following this conflict, in 1844, the USA and France pressured the Qing Dynasty to extend similar status and privileges to them. 
The Second Opium War saw these three powers end the controlled trade of China and bust open the doors of China to trade that set the balance now in favour of Europe and the Americas. It was a bloody drug fueled war that cost lives and stability. Nothing could be done in the face of Western industrial aggression by these military powers. With the knowledge of this via the Chinese and Dutch, of the technological advancements of the West and efficient war machines and strategy, the Bakafu and the Shogun quickly adopted an open policy towards the West in the time of question in this discussion, i.e. the early Bakamatsu period. This was much to the dissatisfaction of the growing nationalists of Japan, known as the Ishin Shichi. Most notably, this group, although spread across Japan, was composed of three main sets of feudal samurai lords, and these were the clans of Satsuma, Choshu, and Tosa. Incidentally, these regions, despite their reverence of the West, had adopted a lot of Western technology. The Lord Samurai of Saga would later play a key role in this era, although in the early stage of Bakumatsu period, he was busy balancing the books as his regional economy was in tatters. The Ishin Shishi was characterized by the phrase and motto Sono Joy, meaning revere the emperor and expel the barbarians. Notably, the Ishin Shishi were not necessarily initially in favor of toppling the shogunate. Tokugawa Yoshinobu was still a teenager but still retained respect from many due to the entrenched samurai culture. On March 11th and again on April 11th, 1863, Emperor Komei, breaking centuries of tradition, defied the shogun's sovereignty and issued Joi Jiko no Chokume, an order to expel the barbarians. This galvanized support for the emperor within the nationalists, and in fact, one lord, Mori Takachika, of the Mori clan in Choshu, immediately began to follow the informal edict, defying the shogun and setting a precedent for the emperor's political voice to be heard and arms to be given to it. Later, on June 24th, 1863, the shogun bowed to the pressure of the emperor and issued an edict to close ports and drive out the foreigners. This was received by foreign powers as an act of aggression and was given disdain by those foreign powers. Two notable theories could arguably be that firstly, the shogun, Tokugawa Yoshinobu, revered the emperor and respected his role as the taikan, protector of the emperor and the nation of Japan, and saw this act of the Mori clan as something he had to condone to secure the status quo of his dominion. Secondly, and pertinently to the English influence on Japan, there was the thorn in the shogun's side, that of the Namamugi Incident. The Namamugi Incident had soured the shogun, and because of this event and the dealings thereafter regarding the West and the shogun, many feudal lords were in doubt of the shogun. The Namamugi Incident is sometimes known as the Richardson Affair. 
This incident occurred one year before the Emperor had begun to voice his political desires. On September 14, 1862, Charles Lennox Richardson, a British merchant, on his way back to the UK to retire with a small band of companions, crossed the line of the procession of the daimyo of the Satsuma domain. The procession was on its way to pay homage to the Shogun, a tradition that was firmly entrenched in Japanese society and a cultural festivity since the beginning of the Edo era. Tokugawa Ieyasu, all those years before, had started the tradition in the Sakoku era as a means to instill a degree of control and unification among the feudal lords that in fact did contribute to lasting security and domestic peace. Almost 300 years of cultural history were disregarded by the British merchant from Kent. These merchants were in fact warned several times to not cross the procession line as they rode alongside seeking a way to cross through. The tradition had long seen many Japanese people of the common class bow in reverence and was an important factor as mentioned in the process of instilling the significantly long, peaceful and stable era that Ieyasu had begun all those years before. And so, one of the high-ranking samurai of the Satsuma domain unleashed his katana and knocked Richardson from his horse. Richardson sustained a significant cut and dropped to the floor, unable to escape, while the others fled the mass of furious samurai. Richardson had disrespected the Japanese culture. Shimizu, the daimyo, and by extension, the shogun, and so was executed with immediate effect under the law of Kiri Sute Gomen. Suddenly, the arrogant merchant found himself being slashed repeatedly. He died an incredibly painful but quick death. Later at the morgue, the British found he had received 10 mortal wounds. It is evidenced that Richardson was purposefully disrespecting the cultural tradition by the fact his uncle commented he was not surprised such an event and death took place. Additionally, Frederick Wright Bruce, the British envoy to China, noted that he remembered Richardson as an arrogant adventurer. It was also noted Richardson was accused of similar behaviour in China and there had been similar occurrences in China in the past in which Richardson showed no respect for culture. Nonetheless, Alcock and the British demanded reparations, and notably for the Kagoshima Lord to apologise. One Ernest Sato, a renowned British diplomat that spent a considerable amount of his life in Japan, was on board the ship on its way to collect the reparations from the Namamugi incident, the Richardson affair. Incidentally, Sato was known as Sato Ainosuke to the Japanese. He was given a Japanese name as he was such a pivotal character of the time and even appreciated by his Japanese colleagues and indeed friends. So, the British ships were closing in on the domain to collect the reparations. Although the Shogun had capitulated, the Satsuma clan's daimyo one Shimazu Hisamitsu had not. The cannon batteries let rip upon the British ships. The British retaliated and flattened the shores of Kagoshima, 
This is known as the bombarding of Kagoshima. Later, in 1864, Sato was with the Allied forces of Britain, France, the Netherlands and the United States, which attacked Shimonoseki. They attacked Shimonoseki in order to gain the right for ships to pass through the Kanmon Straits, i.e. the thin body of sea between Honshu and the main island and Kyushu Island. Sato, during his time in Japan, was in touch with many renowned leaders and figures of the time, including Saigo Takamori of Satsuma, someone we will study further in part two of this series. Sato's father was German, and so he had a good command of Dutch, German and English. English was still relatively unknown in Japan, and so his command of the Dutch language made him indispensable to the British and, in a wider sense, to Japanese foreign relations. Interestingly, Sato is also known for being one of the founding fathers of Japanology. Returning to the point at hand, the Shogun had become a figure that had less respect among many of the daimyo, and reportedly for the first time in the reign of the Tokugawa Shogunate, even satire was created. So perhaps these reasons all contributed to the Shogun's U-turn on foreign relations and acceptance of the Emperor's decree, and set a precedent for the then Emperor to capitalize on power. So, arguably, Sono Joy became a mass movement that the Emperor used to catalyze on his power and displace the Shogun. Another notable contributing factor to this unrest and distrust of the Shogun and the Bakafu was economic, and indeed is a reason that the Emperor felt compelled to voice his concerns in favour of protecting the well-being of his people. The opening of the borders brought about a recession due to a sudden imbalance of trade coupled with a significant blunder of economic policy by the Bakufu. The coins in Japan had a far greater amount of precious metal in them than the rest of the nations involved in the new trade agreements with Japan. Valuable metals flooded out of Japan at an extremely fast rate, with foreign people taking advantage of this blunder. Ergo, there were diplomatic issues, there were economic issues, and significant clashes of culture, all contributing to the decline in support for Tokugawa Yoshinobu among the daimyo and the average citizen. It must be noted again that the nationalists that extolled the motto revere the emperor, expel the barbarians were not initially necessarily in favour of the displacement of the shogun. We will see in the next episode the complexity of the shift in the consciousness of the daimyo and pe the people. There is however a notable number of feudal lords that were still held in contempt by the Shogun. These were the lords that were the descendants of the samurai lords that battled against Ieyasu all those centuries ago in the Sengoku period of the Warring States. Although around 300 years had passed, they still had not been given back any political influence or power, and so the resentment fueled great hate for the Tokugawa regime. The samurai lords, left on the periphery of history and politically powerless, were set to play a significant role 
in the support of the Emperor too, and of course, were of great concern to Tokugawa Yoshinobu. These are all key factors that led to the then samurai Taikun Shogun of Japan capitulating to the Emperor's political voice. Although ostensibly pragmatic in securing the status quo of his dominion and the feudal system, this era would still see his demise. Returning to the point of June 24th, 1863, when the Shogun issued the edict that supported the Emperor and sought to close the ports and expel foreigners. One Edward Neal, the head of the British legation, declared that this is in fact a declaration of war by Japan itself against the whole Treaty of Powers and the consequences of which, if not at once arrested, it will have to expiate by the severest of chastisement. This led to the aforementioned chain of events that led to the Shimonoseki incident at the Straits between Honshu and Kyushu. It also meant that the Western powers when offered the opportunity to acknowledge the Meiji monarchy and government as the true sovereigns of Japan, they were inclined, inclined to do so. We will see more factors that contributed to this change in the winds. Nonetheless, at this moment, which we are talking about in this episode, suddenly the French sided with the Shogunate, the USA Britain and Russia with the Emperor. Though we will see later that the Emperor had a change of heart regarding foreign influence in this time, had seen the nationalists and the citizens turn to his political voice. He had seen Tokugawa Yoshinobu change his stance and capitulate to his voice. Although Tokugawa Yoshinobu and his advisors and elite Bakafu had tried to be pragmatic and protect the status quo, they arguably set forth the motion that would see the end of the shogunate, and from there, later, the end of the samurai. If you enjoyed this piece, please consider hitting follow. I would appreciate that a lot. With thanks to a wonderful elderly Japanese gentleman that will remain unnamed for his highly insightful interview on the era. With thanks to James Fulcher for inspiring an interest in Japanology during my time at uni. Thanks for listening. I hope to make the next part soon. Have a great day.